But welcome to our leadership forum. I'm Joan Reed, Dean for Diversity and Community Partnership. And um, Rhea Boyd, one of our cu current fellows, will be doing the introduction. But um, part of what I wanted to say before we started is our speaker today is someone who I've had the privilege of knowing for a while, of working with on a uh, commission, but someone who I hold um, in, in deep regard and have such a, a large amount of respect for and someone who I have wished and hoped that we could bring her to Harvard Medical School one day. Um, a real hero in terms of what she's done with her career. Um, and so I just wanted to publicly say thank you. Thank you very much, Patty. And with that, Rhea. Hi, everyone. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Gabo. Dr. Patricia Gabo began her medical career at Denver Health in 1973 as head of the renal division and subsequently became director of medical services and finally CEO of Denver Health for 20 years, retiring from that position in 2012. Her initial research and efforts were in electrolytes and fluids and polycystic kidney disease. Her subsequent interest was in health services research. She has authored over 160 articles, book chapters, and books, including a recent book, The Lean Prescription, Powerful Medicine for Our Ailing Healthcare System, which details Denver Health's use of Toyota production systems and was awarded the research award by the Shingo Prize. She was a founding member of the Federal Medicaid and CHIP Payment and Access Commission and currently serves on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Board of Trustees, the Seton Hill University Board of Trustees, the Aspen Group, and the Leadership Consortium for Value and Science-Driven Healthcare of the National Academy of Science, of Medicine, excuse me. Dr. Gabo received her undergraduate degree from Seton Hill University in Greensboro, Pennsylvania, and her medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. She did her training in internal medicine and nephrology at the University of Pennsylvania, Harvard General Hospital, and San Francisco General Hospital. She is a professor emerita of medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and we are pleased to have her speak. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gaba. Well, it's great to be here. I want to say I am not a child prodigy like Joan, so I am actually old. <laughs> and I am not a hero. So clarifying those, let's move on. Before I begin, let me explain my voice. I have a condition called spastic dysphonia, which means I have a twitch in my vocal cords. The treatment for it is Botox. For the women in the room, it does nothing for my wrinkles. But I bet I have beautiful vocal cords. And when I first get it, I sound like Marilyn Monroe. Don't look like her, but sound like her. And when I need it, I sound more like a frog. So I apologize that you're not getting the true Marilyn version of this talk. So having heard that I spent 40 years in a healthcare institution and a safety net, you might ask, why would I ask a question like this? And it's precisely because I spent 40 years at a safety net institution that I do ask this question. We did wonderful things to help the people of Denver, but most of the patients that I saw had issues and challenges that the health system could not possibly solve and address. I also want to be clear that over my 40-year career at Denver Health, I saw American healthcare learn to do amazing things. But it's still critically important that we ask this question, should healthcare institutions be the epicenter for health in America? And we must ask this so that all of us as healthcare leaders can understand accurately what health care can and does do for health in America. So in order to address this overarching question, we have to look at four other questions. What is health? What is our health care system's performance? What are the determinants of health and their impact? And after we have talked about those three, hopefully we can answer the last question, 
what is the way forward to health. The World Health Organization has defined health quite broadly. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease. And recently, Cole has linked that broad definition to the healthcare system by saying some people need health care some of the time, but all people need health and wellness all of the time. This slide is a picture of some of the components of the determinants of health. The healthcare system, income, education, environment, community, genetics, and behavior. And this slide implies that they're all separate. But in fact, they're highly interrelated. Income and education are highly linked. Environment and community are linked. Community and behaviors are linked. And even, even genetics, which for years we thought was clearly in its own silo, now we understand through epigenetics that the environment alters our gene expression, not only in us, but can alter it in our children and our grandchildren. So what I would like to do is walk through each of these uh, parts of this picture, except for genetics, beginning with the healthcare system. What is our healthcare system's performance? Now, if the answer to this question made us say the healthcare system is performing in a spectacularly positive way, we might lean to answering the overarching question with a yes, they should be the epicenter. If, on the other hand, the healthcare system's performance is subpar, we would lean to answering the overarching question no. So in order to answer this question, we need to look at performance in four domains. Cost, coverage and access, quality, equity, and disparity. Now everyone in this room has seen this slide or a variant of this slide. It shows the GDP, um, healthcare as a percent of GDP over time for the developed countries. And what you see is starting back as far as 1980, we were ahead of every other country, ahead or behind, depending which way you want to look at this. But we are spending twice as much as every other developed country. And our rate of increase has been more than every developed country. We are now approaching 18% of our GDP and $3.2 trillion. So why are we spending so much more than every developed country? Well, there are a lot of answers to that question. But one that I've been interested in through my work in Lean has been efficiency. The Bloomberg Healthcare Index, which is actually a value uh, index more than an efficiency, ranked America 50th out of 55 countries in efficiency. We were right down there with Russia and Colombia. Now, a sort of more scientific look at this was done by the IOM a number of years ago, where they documented that 30 to 40 percent of all health care costs are waste. At the time of the study, that was $765 billion of waste. Right now, with our $3.2 trillion of expenditures, we're over $1 trillion in waste. $1 trillion. I want you to keep that number in your head because we're going to come back to it at the end of the talk. Moreover, a RAND study a number of years ago revealed that as much as 30% of these health care costs, Americans do not receive value, and some of this is even harmful. In my opinion, the myriad of delivery and payment models are a major contributor to this 
inefficiency that we see in our healthcare system. Now you're going to see a number of slides throughout this talk that look like this. They have the peer countries listed on the vertical axis and the comparable country averages in blue and the United States is shown in brown. We have the lowest insured rate of all comparable developed countries because everybody else insures everyone. Um, we stand alone, American exceptionalism, we stand alone in not insuring everybody. And insurance in America matters. This is a study done by the Kaiser Family Foundation looking at the barriers to health care among non-elderly adults by insurance status. Uninsured people, shown in dark blue, have almost five to, are almost five times as likely as people on Medicaid or private insurance of having no usual source of care. They're much more likely to postpone seeking care due to cost, to go without care due to cost, and to not fill the prescriptions they need to treat their illness. We did have a major expansion of health care coverage with the ACA, which may not survive. Uh, but even at the peak of the ACA coverage, we had 30 million Americans who still did not have coverage. And we should all be aware that coverage does not equal access. We saw this quite dramatically recent, in recent years with the VA. And for Medicaid patients who often live in physician shortage areas, this access remains a problem, particularly for specialists and oral health care. Now, for all this expenditure, do we have the best life expectancy of all our peer countries? No, we have the lowest life expectancy of all our comparative countries. Now you may say, well, there's just a three-year difference. Three years, that doesn't matter. Well, of course, it matters a lot if it's you. Uh, that's one point. The second is to put this in perspective. People have said if this great cancer moonshot were to succeed and we cured all cancer, it would add three years to the life expectancy of the population. So three years is a non-trivial number from a population perspective. Now, not only do we have the lowest life expectancy, we're getting worse. This slide shows the probability of surviving to age 50 for women. Since the 1980s, we were at the bottom of our peer countries. But since the early 1990s, we're falling completely off the curve. This is similar, although not quite as dramatic for males. And we've heard a lot about this lately, even in the lay press, about our life expectancy is going down. Now, this decrease in life expectancy starts out right from the very beginning. It should shock you to know that we have, the low, we have the highest infant mortality of any peer country. Look at the difference between us and Sweden. It's, it's actually should make you gasp. Could you all please gasp? <laughs> now, here comes your first quiz. So you're going to get a test. I love tests. Uh, when I give them, that is. <laughs> so this is a graph of life expectancy by age as an international comparison. The vertical axis is rank among the 17 peer countries. One is the best. And age from 0 to 99 is across the bottom. So I want you to draw the line of where America ranks on all these ages. You can draw one line because the male and the female line actually look pretty similar. 
And the line doesn't have to be straight. It can go up and down. It can look like Colorado mountains. What, however you want to draw it. I'm giving you a few seconds. I'm not collecting the papers. You aren't drawing. <laughs> Here's what the graph looks like. Now, if you didn't get it right, I've given this to many people. I haven't had a single healthcare professional get this right yet. You got it right? Oh, one, you get a star. After, come up after and I'll give you a star. So from zero to four, we're 17 out of 17. From 19 to 44, when we are in our most productive years, we're 17th. We are never above 15 until age 75, when we start going up. And when we're 95, when most of us are dead, <laughs> we become number one. <laughs> now, given this enormous expenditure of health care, you would hope that would be, we would be one all the way across, or at least two, three, or four. And if we couldn't do that, wouldn't you want us to have the highest life expectancy at the beginning of life? And then, as our old governor used to say, people like me should just roll over and die. So, uh, now, our investment parallels this. This is a comparison of per capita health expenditure by age. And in other developed countries, it does go up a little bit as people age because people do get sicker. But we go up spectacularly. This is where we're putting our resources. 25% of the Medicare budget is spent in the last year of life. Now, if you put these two facts together, life expectancy in years on the vertical axis and expenditure in parity purchasing along the bottom, you see that for most countries, if you invest a little more, you get a little more life expectancy. But we are a outlier was spending way more and not getting an increase in our life expectancy that other countries achieve. Now, clearly, uh, life expectancy isn't the only determinant of quality, although it's commonly used because it's an ambiguous endpoint, and therefore the data is readily available. But another measure of quality is how safe are our institutions. And I would say for at least the last decade, we've been trying to improve reliability of our healthcare institutions and safety. And we have done some great things. We've reduced ventilator associated pneumonia, we've reduced catheter induced infection. But this is a recent study that showed that medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the United States, almost equal to the next four combined. So in this aspect of quality, we also are not performing well. What about the last measure, equity and disparity? There's marked disparity by race, ethnicity, socioeconomic group, and geography in coverage, access, care, and mortality. This is also data from the Kaiser Family Fund looking at the number of health status and outcome measures for which groups fared better, the same, or worse compared to whites. And for all minority groups except Asians, they fare worse than whites, with blacks faring worse in 24 of the 29 measures. This slide elaborates on that observation in some detail. African Americans compared to whites are twice as likely to have a low birth weight baby. Their babies are more likely to die in the first year of life. Their children are twice as likely to have asthma. 
as adults, they are one and a half to two times as likely to suffer a stroke or have heart disease. And life expectancy is five years less for black men than white men, and three years less for black women than white women. We also have huge geographic disparity. This is data from the Commonwealth Fund, your friend and funder, uh, looking at about 40 variables that measure health. And they look at it by state, comparing each state to the best performance that's available. And what you see is the South is not doing well. And it has not done well on repeated measurements over the years. Now, I'm sure you're all looking at my state, Colorado, shining brightly in the middle of the country, uh, being in the top quartile. And you are undoubtedly saying, we must be very proud of our health care performance in Colorado. And we are, but it actually has more to do with recreational marijuana than our health care performance. We're all happily high in Colorado. <laughs> Although I'm personally not in that group. But if you go down one layer, and this is data from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, looking at approximately 25 variables of health by county. And what you see in Colorado, there is the same geographic variability. And this is true for every single state they looked at. There is no state, even the top performing states like Colorado, that are homogeneously doing well. And if you go down one layer more and look at Denver City, you will see that within a few miles, there's an 11 year difference in life expectancy. Now remember, if we cured all cancer, we get a three year improvement of population life expectancy. This is big. Now Denver is not an outlier. This is Washington DC. The same kind of huge disparity in life expectancy within a few miles. And even out in the sunny west, where everyone is hale and hearty, in Phoenix, you see the same difference. This geographic variability has led many people to say, your zip code matters more than your genetic code in terms of your life expectancy and well-being. And I will point out that the variability you saw from state to state will only get worse if we go to Medicaid block grants. Little aside. So what we have seen, I hope I've convinced you, is that we have significant issues in our healthcare system's performance in cost, coverage and access, quality, equity, and disparity. And if that were not enough, the National Academy of Medicine has recently said that the system also suffers from duplication, fragmentation, misalignment between physicians and patients in terms of incentives, and adoption of new technologies of uncertain efficacy. Now, looking at all this data, the people at the National Academy of Medicine asked the obvious question. Why, despite higher expenditure than almost any other country, have we achieved less health? And it's a question I hope that all of you are asking right now. And their answer, I might add 400 and some pages later, was a major reason lies in the fact that the foci of our attention, of our resources, of our incentives are too narrow. Our investments are primarily directed at a biomedical focus. Well, what does this mean? I think Elizabeth Bradley has illustrated this in her study. She looked at total expenditure in peer countries for health care and social care. Five countries actually spend more than we do in total, but no country spends more on health care than social care. 
We alone are spending more on health care, almost twice as much than we do on social care. Which leads to the question, what are the social determinants of health and what are their impact? So back to our determinants of health, Will. Well, the health care system likely accounts for about 15% of health in that range, 15 to 18%. The other components of the wheel, except for genetics, account for more than 50% of health. So let's explore how we do in each of these compared to other countries, starting with income and community. It does appear that income really is the primary determinant of health. So how are we doing? Well, we're the richest country of the peer countries but we have the highest percentage of poverty of any developed country. And not only that, we have the highest degree of income inequality compared to every other wealthy country. And income cascades down to two other things which affect health, food and housing. Not surprisingly, having a low income is the major reason for food insecurity. 42 million people, including 13 million children, live in households with food insecurity in the United States. And 41 million people have housing insecurity, which means they're spending more than 30% of their resources on housing. And for the very poor, that's up to 50%. So I have very little money left for anything else, which obviously impacts health. Now, income has a strong association directly on health outcomes. And this is data looking at that association. Life expectancy at age 40 increases with income percentile. Life expectancy at age 40 for the wealthiest 1% is 10 to 15 years greater than the poorest 1%. And life expectancy for men at age 40 in the poorest 1% is that of a man in Sudan, where I might add they're actively killing people. <coughs> Now, you might say, well, that's at the extreme, the bottom 1% and the top 1%. But there was a recent study in Colorado that said the top 25% of income are living 6 to 10 years longer than the bottom 25% of income. And although there's an association with income and longevity across the entire range of income, the effect is much more dramatic at the bottom and once you're above 200,000, it is less dramatic. That should say something about income distribution in this country. Now, here's your next quiz. Uh, this is your last question, so don't worry. It's not going to keep going. If you were very poor, from a point of view of life expectancy, do you think you would be better off living in New York, San Francisco, Dallas, or Detroit? Okay, well, I naively said when I asked myself this question, well, if you're very poor, you wouldn't want to live in New York or San Francisco because they are so expensive. In point of fact, if you're very poor, the best place to live is New York City, and the worst place to live is Detroit. Now, there are many reasons for this, but one reason which is given is New York and San Francisco invest a lot in the social care safety net. So they look more like every other developed country than other cities. And it suggests that even if you can't fix the income disparity, if you invest in the social safety net, you somewhat ameliorate the effects of poverty. Now there's another relationship that is occurring in this country between income and community. And that is, we're concentrating poverty in America. We're building the proverbial wall. So that this slide shows population in millions on the vertical axis and the concentration of people 
in medium, where there's a medium concentration of poverty, that is 20 to 30 percent of the people are in poverty, or a high concentration where 30 percent or more of the people are in poverty. And when you live in a neighborhood with a high concentration of poverty, there are many downstream effects, housing, schools, jobs, safety, environmental exposure. So this concentration of poverty in neighborhoods is not a good thing for the health of America. Well, let's look at the next piece of Art Wheel, education. Everybody in this room knows about early brain development and how important education is early in life. This shows all of the uh, OECD countries. And the average country has 81% of their three and four year olds in school. We have 54% below Mexico. Probably not where we want to be. Education at the other end of the spectrum, college, has a big effect as well on longevity. For white men, there's a 6.8 year increase in life expectancy with a college degree without finishing high school. For black men, 10 years. For white women, 5.1 years. And for black women, six years. Let's look at environment and behaviors. The United States has the highest environmental burden of disease compared to all other high-income countries. This is occupational risks, agricultural risks. Um, in, we've seen this quite dramatically in Flint, Michigan, recently in Colorado. We had mine leakages where the major rivers turned orange from the heavy metals coming out of the mines. This is probably not going to improve. Um, in the near future. Now, one uh, source of pollution which the World Health Organization has recently pointed out is air pollution. Uh, and reducing air pollution has a major effect not only on respiratory diseases, which we all would have guessed, but on stroke, heart disease, and lung cancer. Behaviors have an enormous impact on health. And these are the behaviors that are most important. Tobacco use, diet, physical inactivity, alcohol and drug use, sexual practices, and injurious behaviors. We actually have less alcohol and tobacco use than many developed countries, although tobacco still is a major cause of preventable deaths. And although we have less alcohol use, we have more alcohol-related disease than other countries. Let's look at diet and physical activity um, in some detail. But before, let me say that f by some estimates, 40% of all US deaths are related to tobacco use, unhealthy diet, physical activity, and problem drinking. Regarding diet, the people in the United States perform more, eat more calories per day than any other country in the world. We ingest more calories per day than any other country in the world, and we tend to be less physically active. So guess where that leads? It leads to us having the highest prevalence of obesity among comparable countries. And the BMI at various ages is highest in the United States across many age groups. And this high incidence of obesity is leading to our di diabetes epidemic. We have a high burden of disease uh, from drug abuse. And certainly, opioids have gotten a lot of attention later uh, recently. And we are higher than every other developed country in that and in other uh, drug abuse. Injurious behavior is a very important cause of death in the United States. This slide shows the deaths per 100,000 person year observations in adolescent and young males related to violence. As far back as 1955, we were ahead of every developed country, and now we're spectacularly ahead of them. And a good deal of this 
relates to guns. The United States has a higher rate of years lost to disability and premature death due to firearm assaults than any comparably large and wealthy country. In fact, 80% of all firearm deaths in the world occur in the United States, not something that, again, makes us exceptional in a positive way. So we've looked at these determinants of health and an international comparison. Let's bring it home, or at least to my home, and to Colorado. And you saw this slide of the geographic disparity. Let's take this down and look at it between two counties. This is data from RWJF. And they ranked 60 of Colorado's 64 counties. Douglas County ranked number one and Denver 44th out of 60. So is that because Denver doesn't have enough health care? Well, it has more primary care physicians than Douglas, one for every 170, nine, 90 persons. It has 10 times almost the clinics and hospitals that Douglas has. So if it were the health facility, they should be doing great. Denver should be one. Yet, we have more premature deaths than Douglas County. So is this related, if it's not to the healthcare system, is it to the social determinants of health? And the data certainly is suggestive. Denver has more minorities, lower graduation rate from high school, greater income inequality, more children in poverty, more food insecurity, more housing problems, and more violent crime per 100,000 people. So if we want Denver to be like Douglas County, we do not need more hospitals, more freestanding EDs, more urgent care facilities. We now have the Starbucks model of health care in Denver. There is something on every corner. But if we want Denver to get better, we have to put our investments in the social determinants of health. So given all I've told you, what's the way forward here? Is there a way forward, I guess, is the first question. So let's go back to what the National Academy of Medicine said. They said our false eye was too narrow. So can the healthcare system be the entity that broadens our national healthcare focus from its current narrow biomedical focus to the broader determinants of health? I think the answer to that is absolutely no. It is not in their financial best interest. And in the current medical industrial complex, what is not in your financial best interest is not what you do. So that isn't to say that the healthcare systems have nothing they can do. They can do something. They can continue their efforts on access, cost, and quality. They can increase their focus on the behavior components. In Denver, all the hospitals have closed their psych beds. So instead of building more med surge beds and more urgent care facilities, they should be investing in um, behavioral health treatment. They could contribute to community education on the social determinants and advocate for those. They could coordinate their community <coughs> benefits to really address the social safety net, and they could create better linkages with the social safety net. They could also expand some of their own social safety net capabilities. Given what we know about income, they could pay a living wage to all their employees and reduce the income inequity between the executives and the housekeepers. And given what we know about education, they could have robust tuition reimbursement <laughs> program for all their workers, not just those who are getting advanced degrees. But at the end of the day, here's the core problem. We have to redistribute money from the healthcare system to the social care system. And that is not going to come from the hospitals. Now, remember that $1 trillion number of waste that I told you? We need to take that $1 trillion of waste out of the healthcare system and redistribute it to the other components of health. This is a lot easier to say than do. But I will tell you from someone who has done lean 
at Denver Health, we took $192 million out of our system, a poor safety net. And while we did that, we became number one, having the lowest mortality of all 117 academic health centers in the United States. So getting rid of waste by improving your processes doesn't make your system less well functioning, it improves your functioning. However, I also learned in my experience at Denver Health that it's very hard to take money out of someone's hand. They tend to close it as soon as you start <laughs> reaching for it. But, so this means that redistribution will require greater understanding by our leaders of the real determinants of health. We have to get over 21st century care, cancer moonshots. We have to start thinking about putting investments in the other determinants of health, which will require the government to have change in policy and health care payments, tax policy, expenditure distribution, and regulation. I'm not optimistic about seeing this tomorrow, or maybe even in my lifetime, because I'm old. But uh, we had a governor who said, if you don't start talking about it, it will never happen. So I'm talking about it. So there are some things that we know that are pretty simple uh, to do that starts this. The earned income tax credit, surprisingly, has bipartisan support. This program gives low earners money back. In, not, in 2015, it took 6.2 million people out of poverty. This needs to be expanded to include people without children. To address the 41 million with food insecurity, you need food, which is the SNAP program, the old uh, food stamp program. There are many people who are eligible who are not enrolled. 60% in Colorado who are eligible are enrolled. And the amount of money given per meal is too small. This needs to be expanded both in terms of outreach and the dollar amount. Under Lyndon Johnson Child Nutrition Program, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Program was introduced, which is school breakfast, school lunch, summer feeding program, women, infants, and children program. This needs to be reauthorized. They're now arguing about whether pizza is a vegetable or something. Uh, but there's a program aimed at obesity for comprehensive physical activity with the goal is to give every child in school 60 minutes of exercise either before, during, or after school, and to train them and their families to make this sustainable. This is not mandatory. And as you will note in your districts, when school districts get into trouble, physical education is often uh, something that gets on the chopping block. The Nurse Home Visiting Program also has bipartisan support, where nurses go in to the homes of pregnant women before they deliver and for two years afterwards. This increases the spacing in children and makes those children healthier and more successful throughout their life. Um, in Colorado, 34% of the women eligible for this program are getting it. Tobacco success cessation has a positive effect and universal preschool is something that we know has an effect and we should adopt. But at the end of the day, this will not be enough. I think we're going to have to have some significant disruption in healthcare to do that. We have to end fee-for-service. We have to end the fragmented delivery and payment model. And I have a hope that their technology may cause major shifts. The remote devices could enable more patient directed care and patient-enabled care. You can get a Band-Aid now for 50 cents that transmits a full EKG. And these kinds of things, I think, could really help. Augmented intelligence with IBM Watson hopefully will help us not do things which are not indicated and even harmful to the patients. And then there's the globalization of services. We have to look at India. They are doing amazing things with prosthesis for $25, while ours are 12,000. 
they're doing cataract surgery in an automated way so that their surgeons can do four times the number of cataracts in a day that our ophthalmologists can do. And they have a lens that costs $2. My father-in-law just got a lens that cost $2,500. And Shetty, with his cardiac surgery, can, again, have an assembly line for cardiac surgery so that it costs $800. And Bill Frist was telling me it has the same outcome that he had when he was doing cardiac surgery. So maybe this is a way to destabilize uh, and disrupt our current system. So I think we know the road to a brighter health care. The question is, will we walk down the road? So I ask you, as healthcare leaders, do you believe we must make this pivot from healthcare to the social determinants of health to achieve health for everyone in America? And most importantly, are you willing to be a leader in making this pivot? Thank you very much. I'll be glad to answer your questions.